Celebrating 43 years on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, are trade relations thawing just a little? China makes a gesture and the USMCA may see action soon. Plus, ATVs are popular in rural America. This week, Make-A-Wish makes a young boy's ATV wish come true. In Southern gardening, you may be used to seeing green, but how about red for a change? That could be a good thing. And in our feature, they grew the family business the old-fashioned way. They earned it. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everybody, I'm Mike Russell. Thanks for being with us today on Farm Week. The trade war between the U.S. and China, now almost two years long, took a step back to the brink this week. China signaled a return to moving more American pork and soybeans through the checkout counter and vowed to lift punitive tariffs on other products ahead of continuing trade talks. Here's Paul Yeager with our weekly update. Officially, China has stopped purchases of America's agricultural products. But as the fields turn toward harvest, so did the story with the economic giant. The Chinese began buying U.S. soybeans this week. The news came just hours after a report revealing July was good for domestic pork producers. The U.S. Meat Export Federation has reported, despite a 62% tariff on American-made pork, Chinese imports of the protein were up 51% over a year earlier. Late in the week, the U.S. and China pledged reductions or delays of tariffs on some goods caught in the trade war. The exact concessions vary, but all were made in good faith ahead of scheduled talks for next month. Well, there's no question. The only reason why China is seriously negotiating with us is because of the tariffs. And this president is dealing with issues that should have been dealt with for the last 20 or 30 years. So uh, tariffs do work. It's what's brought them to the table. No different than sanctions work. And the president, of course, is a negotiator. So this, this delay was a goodwill gesture and nothing more than that. As the president tweeted about the expectation China would be buying large amounts of agricultural products, the Treasury Secretary tempered enthusiasm. I spoke to the Chinese, I believe, about a week ago. Uh, there is a deputy level meeting that is set up. I believe it's either next week or the following week. They're coming here. We expect there'll be active work done. The ambassador and I have a date in the beginning of October. I think, you know, with some of the logistics issues, First of all, the ambassador is very focused on getting USMCA done now that Congress is back in session. So that's the number one priority. We have UNGA coming up. Uh, the ambassador is working on the Japanese deal. So it's really just logistics issues. My expectation is they'll be here in October unless something changes. As Congress returned to Washington, farm state lawmakers hoped USMCA would be one of the progress points as well. Modernizing and improving our trade relationships with Canada and Mexico is a bipartisan no-brainer. Senator Charles Grassley stayed on message that he delivered while touring Iowa during the legislative break. Se apliquen medidas. Mexico's president, Andres Manuel López Obrador, pledged support for passing USMCA. And Canada's Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, is starting As his re-election campaign make... by touting the benefits of working with the United States. We renegotiated NAFTA, securing trade access to our largest and most important trading partner at a time of U.S. protectionism and unpredictability. USTR Robert Lighthizer says negotiations with China are still challenging, but Chinese buyers bought an additional quarter million tons of soybeans just days ago to kick off the new marketing year. High-level trade talks are expected again next month. As you may have heard, the waters of the U.S. rule and Obama holdover, long a thorn in the side of farmers and ranchers, has been repealed, an ongoing pledge carried out by President Trump. EPA Administrator Andrew Wheeler announced what he called Step 1 days ago at a press conference. President Trump issued an executive order directing the EPA and the Army to review and, if appropriate, replace the 2015 definition. Today's action finalizes Step 1 
of our response to the President's executive order. Step one repeals the 2015 rule and recodifies the longstanding and familiar regulatory texts that existed previously. It also sets the stage for step two, our proposed revised definition of waters of the United States. In December of last year, the EPA and the Army issued a new proposed definition that would clearly define where federal jurisdiction begins and ends in accordance with the Clean Water Act and Supreme Court precedent. Zippy Duvall, president of the American Farm Bureau, signaled step two with this tweet, quote, Farm Bureau is hopeful that farmers soon will have common sense rules we have been calling for. As we look to the new clean water rule, the administration is finalizing. He had more to say at the press conference itself. We have never seen a sense of urgency on any issue over and above what this has generated in our, our grassroots. We had tens of thousands of phone calls, contacts, emails, comments made across America. Tens of thousands. We started a campaign called Ditch the Rule. We've never had engagement from our grassroots like we have on this issue. When you take the private property rights from a man that's worked all his life or, or generations in his family to work, pay for, t pay the taxes on, to grow the food and fiber for all of us to sit down and enjoy three times a day, that is very intrusive to him and he can it's something that he just can't stand for. So we really have been excited about being part of this day. Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue calls the action a victory, but there was pushback. California is already threatening to sue. Environmental groups are also threatening to challenge the appeal. A narrower version of the rule is expected by the end of the year. On to an inspiring story. You know this, ATVs are a huge part of rural life used for almost everything from hunting to hauling and most things in between. But for one young man in Mississippi in the fight of his life with a brain tumor, his wish for an ATV needed a little help from some very special people. Regina Boykin was overwhelmed with gratitude on so many levels. Mississippi Make-A-Wish and the employees of Lyle Machinery in Jackson gathered to honor her son John. They gave him his wish to have an ATV of his own. It's amazing. I'm so thankful for it and I couldn't be happier. John has a brain tumor. He and his family found out early in 2018. It's called a grade two astrocytoma and because of where it's located, it cannot be removed surgically. The good news is that tumor is finally responding to laser treatment. In fact, John is doing well enough that he was able to attend special ATV training from Mississippi State University Extension in order to receive his dream come true. He scans every three months and if he doesn't have any side effects or any other issues by the end of the year, they'll, they'll put that out to every six months and then every year. But um, there may be some long-term effects or we were told that there would be long-term effects. He's had um, executive functioning is the only thing that has been affected and he takes a medication for that. Uh, you can look at him and not even tell that he's, you know, had a brain tumor. As kids lined up for rides on Lyle's heavy machinery, company owner Dan Lyle said a lot with very few words. He's had a real tough time of it and I'm proud he got to get his new four-wheeler today and he seems very happy. Even a Lyle employee, an accountant by day, artist by night, added color literally to the celebration, painting a picture in honor of John, who said he hopes to one day become a veterinarian. Needless to say, John loves his new ATV. A young hunter, he says he'll get a lot of use out of it. In the meantime, his parents say their 16-year-old high school junior is a pretty special young man. He did so good through everything. You know, he's never complained about anything. And, you know, it got him down a little bit, but he, you really wouldn't know it by being around him that, that he was going through this. He's a gift from God. He has a servant's heart. He loves to play with kids and help people. Um, he loves to be on the farm, working any kind of machinery, spending time with his pawpaw. Um, and he loves horseback riding and ATVs. I'm really proud to have him as my son because he, 
he's everything that my daddy could ask for in the son. You know, he just, nobody could ask for any more. John's mom says Jay-Z, as he's known to his family, John Zachary, is doing well. His latest scans indicate his tumor is shrinking. He used to have an ATV, but it broke down a while back. Now, thanks to Make-A-Wish Mississippi and Lyle Machinery, he's back in the saddle. Great story. As we said at the top of the show, you might be used to seeing green in your landscape, but how about a little red for a change? In fact, the color in your garden doesn't have to come from just the flowers. There's another way to brighten up the back 40. Here's Gary Bachman to help, your, help you color your world. Some of the most stunning effects a gardener can take advantage of is growing plants with vibrant red or purple foliage. Let's take a look at a few of my favorites. We're used to seeing large patches of vibrant green ornamental sweet potato ground cover. But I think I found a new favorite that's quite different. Sweet Caroline Red Hawk Sweet Potato Vine is a fine choice for the garden with its attractive, deeply cut lobed leaves, which emerge light green and transition to a vibrant red throughout the season. Sweet Caroline Red Hawk has a dense trailing habit, eventually spilling over the edges of the landscape bed. It has a relatively fine texture, which sets it apart from other garden plants. A great Alternanthera selection is Purple Prince, a tropical stunner with ravishing, splashy, and colorful foliage. The spreading masses of Purple Prince rolls out like a magic carpet of burgundy purple and its beautiful leaves are complemented by reddish ruby rose undersides. The colors intensify when grown in the full sun. This plant thrives in blast furnace heat and sun, requires little water, and is disease resistant. I think that garden plants with red foliage are stunning. A favorite is Dragon's Breast Celosia with its unique red-green foliage that is topped with blazing red feathery flowers that resemble flames licking upwards. A great feature is the color intensifies during the harsh conditions of the summer season. You can't go wrong with these plants in your landscape. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. In a short market segment, people still talking about those 31 small refinery exemptions, especially folks in the corn growing business hoping to create more demand for their higher ending stocks. We're expecting some kind of major ethanol announcement from the USDA soon, but in the meantime, here's analyst Ted Seifert with the bigger picture. The SREs are not a good thing for the ethanol industry. We've seen, I think, what, 23 plants close in the last few months. You know, the thing is, is that a lot of these, these plants that are being idled it's, they're coming from companies that have other more efficient uh, uh, facilities that are kind of picking up some of that slack. We haven't seen a huge drop in ethanol production, but it's not a good feeling going into next year. It's not great when you see the USDA cut 25 million bushels off of uh, new crop ethanol uh, usage. So, you know, the ethanol is a problem. I want to be optimistic about our, our ethanol export demand. Again, a trade deal would help with that. Uh, I think ethanol, um, the rest of the world is coming along. Maybe we're not domestically as much. We need to really be pushing E85 more. Uh, but I'm optimistic for ethanol. However, we need to fix the RIN mm -hmm. problem and the SRE problem. Time now for today's trivia quiz, and since we're talking about ethanol, this one is apropos. Last year, 210 renewable fuel facilities in 27 states produced a little over 16 billion gallons of ethanol. That was a record. In the U.S., most ethanol is made from corn, so here's today's question. On average, how many pounds of corn does it take to make a gallon of ethanol? Is the answer A, 10 pounds, B, 20, C, 30, or D, 40 pounds? We'll have the answer coming up. Time for a short break, but stay put. Coming up at our Farm Week feature, a story that could start with a joke, but trust me, this is no laughing matter. One man says it could be a national security issue. We're in Pennsylvania, a state that produces all by itself two thirds of the entire American mushroom supply. In fact, one county calls itself the mushroom capital of the world. There's a lot more to this industry than meets the eye, though. We go behind the scenes coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. 
Mississippi 4-H celebrates a rich history of youth development through creative hands-on experiences. Programs emphasize leadership, technology, science, and agriculture. But it's a lot more than that. making the best better. Before we get back to the market report, let's take a look at the Farm Week calendar. First, from 9 to 2 on Friday and Saturday, October 11th and 12th, at the Truck Crop Branch Experiment Station in Crystal Springs, about 25 miles south of Jackson, the Fall Flower and Garden Fest. This two-day event is the largest home gardening show in the southeast with average attendance of about 5,000 people. The event is free and there will be plenty of food on hand. For more information, call 601-892-3731. Next, it's Breakfast on the Farm, October 17th through 19th from 9 to noon at the Bearden Dairy Center at MSU in Starkville. Learn where your food comes from, milk a cow, tour the dairy. The first two days are for school field trips. The 19th, that's a Saturday, is open to the public. Registration opens soon. For more info, call Amanda Stone at 662-769-9941. Now, check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. The USDA just released its monthly supply and demand report. Nothing earth-shattering in it, but it did raise a few eyebrows here and there. Will Maples, new to the Farm Week team, talks about that WASD report and what it means at this point in the year. Well, Will, welcome to Farm Week. It's good to have you on the team. Thank you, Mike. I'm glad to be here. And it's good to have you. You'll be focusing primarily on row crops. Yes, sir. So I'll be a row crop economist, mainly focusing on crop marketing. Okay, good. Well, we're going to be looking forward to all those reports. Let's get right to it. The USDA released its latest WASDE report. It looks like soybeans stole the show. Why is that? That's true, Mike. Soybeans were really the talk of the town after this report came out. It's overall, they lowered soybean production in this report by about 47 million bushels this year. Mm -hmm. And this was mainly due to a decrease in their yield estimates. So now they're saying yields are going to be about 47.9 bushels this year. Okay. But the main thing that was in this report that a lot of people weren't expecting is they put ending stocks down to 600, 640 million bushels. So this is still a pretty good large number of ending stocks for soybeans, but if you compare where we were last year at over a billion bushels at this time, mm -hmm. they have really dropped that number a lot. And you know, looking at how the yields are growing this year so far, we could potentially see ending stocks down could discuss below 500 million, and that's just kind of remarkable from where we were at last year. Thanks to Will for that report, and yes, he's the brother of ag economist Josh Maples, also on the Farm Week team looking at livestock. Back to the trivia quiz now as we wrap up today's short market segment. Today's question was, on average, how many pounds of corn does it take to make a gallon of ethanol? Was the answer 10 pounds, 20, 30, 40 pounds? Well, we know that a bushel of corn weighs about 56 pounds. From that, according to the Renewable Fuels Association, you can get about 2.8 gallons of ethanol. So you do the math. 56 divided by 2.8 equals about 20 pounds of corn per gallon. If you chose B, you picked the right answer. Time for today's feature story, arguably a great agricultural success. A family mushroom business in Pennsylvania where more mushrooms are grown than in any other state in America. It's not one of the easiest businesses to be in, but with this kind of persistence, there's a payoff like few other. Here's Colleen Bradford Krantz with the story. Anyone in southeastern Pennsylvania worth their weight in Maitake knows the story of how the mushroom industry began here. It's not about the area's climate, terrain, or soil. The mushrooms all started back in the late 1800s. When a carnation grower sun saw a waste of space under the carnation beds. In a Kennett Square city market, similar to this one in New York City. He was very fastidious and wanted to make the best use of all the resources. Took a steamship to Europe where they were growing mushrooms in Paris. And he brought in the mushroom spawn. So in 1902, uh, Swain and a fellow named Harry Hicks built the first building uh, specifically to grow mushrooms. 
industry started to take root, support companies sprung up, and it just mushroomed into what it is today. Today, Pennsylvania is the nation's top producer of mushrooms, growing and picking 67% of the United States' 827 million pounds of the most commonly cultivated mushrooms, such as white button. California comes in a distant second, raising 11%. Chester County, and specifically the community of Kennett Square, have labeled themselves the mushroom capital of the world. The city of 6,000 holds an annual mushroom festival, serves mushroom-focused dishes in nearly every restaurant, and even has a mushroom-themed gift shop. It's great for the economy here in Chester County, and, you know, the industry probably employs probably 10,000 people, and it's, it's amazing. There's always jobs. We need pickers. We need all kinds of people in the industry. Yet it's not always an easy business. A new report from the National Agricultural Statistics Service shows the volume of all U.S. mushrooms slipping 10% over the past three years. Jim Angelucci, general manager of Phillips Mushroom Farms, says the startup and overhead costs are significant for those trying to get into the business. Labor, however, has perhaps been the biggest problem as some companies struggle to hire enough workers to pick their mushrooms. Like many dairy farmers, mushroom producers are not allowed to hire temporary international workers under the H-2A visa program because the work occurs year-round. Since we grow mushrooms 24-7, 365, we're not considered seasonal. My comment is, you know, our crop's only nine weeks long. We just elect to do it six and a half times a year. If we don't do something, I consider it a national security issue. Uh, we've got to have labor, and we're going to lose the salad bowl in California if we don't get labor. Phillips Mushrooms has been around for 92 years and is now the world's largest grower of exotic mushrooms. Angelucci said finding labor is still a battle for the company, even with a new state-of-the-art mushroom farm the company built just across the state line in Warwick, Maryland. Growers pick inside climate-controlled buildings with humidity and temperature set to the perfect range for mushrooms. However, that doesn't isolate the company financially from consequences of extreme weather. We don't have to deal with the elements uh, directly. We do, um, you know, when it's 105 degrees here in, in the summer and our electric meters are spinning off the wall because of the electricity we're using to cool the rooms, that's a direct effect of, of the weather. The cost of doing business continues to escalate, the cost of compliance uh, with the government. The Warwick facility, where additional buildings are still being constructed, features stainless steel rather than the traditional wooden growing shelves. The complex was begun when the company decided to return to growing large volumes of white button mushrooms, which it had moved away from. The stainless steel shelves are easier to wash down when the compost, or substrate, is changed after a batch of mushrooms is harvested. Our Maryland facility is, it's called the Dutch style of growing. We decided when we were going to venture back into growing white agaricus mushrooms in 2009 that we would look at state-of-the-art facilities to do that, food safety being the most important factor. So we spent a couple years going back and forth to Europe before we, we finally decided on the design. The mushrooms, as they have always been, are grown in a special type of substrate. Stall bedding from a nearby horse track is used, as is old straw and hay, preventing that material from being tossed into a landfill. Some of the area's mushroom farmers own the composting facility as a shared cooperative, and the materials are blended and prepared for all. Angelucci, even before working for the Phillips, new mushroom farming and how to work with the substrate. My father told me when I was nine years old to put something on the table beside my elbows. So he took me down to uh, our friend, mushroom farmer down the end of the street, the Avello brothers. And I was a little kid on top of the pile with a hose, making sure that we had enough water in the compost to make sure that it reacted properly. Angelucci feels good about where the company and industry are heading, particularly if the labor problem can be resolved. And recent studies point to a possible connection between eating white button mushrooms and inhibiting the development of breast cancer in older women. The Mushroom Council is encouraging Americans who are considering becoming vegetarians 
to instead blend chopped mushrooms into their ground meats, becoming blenditarians. It's actually not replacing meat. Research has shown that the increase in beef because of the blend, uh, they have incremental sales increase because people feel better about eating it now. A blenditarian is one who believes that the meaty, mighty mushroom makes meals more nutritious, delicious, and sustainable. Thanks, Colleen. Good story. Well, next week, another inspiring story, a young girl doing big things for one so young. She's 11 years old, but you'd never know it. In just a year, 4-H'er Peyton Bell has come far. She's young, but driven, and she's got a bushel of awards that prove she loves what she's doing. The rest of what they call her goat village is right there too, helping her roll with the punches. The sweet story of a young girl who lights up the show ring. That's next time on Farm Week. And before we go, we'll follow up on that fourth grader bullied because of his homemade University of Tennessee shirt. Turns out that UT offered the boy a full scholarship. When he's ready for college, if he wants to join the class of 2032, his tuition and fees are covered for all four years. Congratulations to that young man. More than 50,000 shirts already uh, pre-sold for charity's sake. We wish him well. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And please don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.